Thanks. It's so fun to be back in Austin. Um, the story about the Withings scale that I told John Stewart, it's actually, it, um, Arielle is, is here from Withings, and so she'll tell you about sort of the hazards of oversharing. But what I told, what I told John was that, was that at about the same time that, that um, Foursquare announced check-ins, and I started checking in at a new local bakery in Boston, I also started tweeting my weight at the same time. And so some, some friends noticed that there was some correlation between like my lack of weight loss and my check-in, my regular check-ins at the bakery. So that's sort of the, one of the problems with, uh, with uh, information transparency. <laughs> All right, well, I'm excited to be here. Um, uh, there's some books that uh, I recently came out with a book called Enchanted Objects that has an umbrella on the front. Um, this was a product that I invented at uh, a company called Ambient Devices. Does anybody remember that company? We made an orb and some other sort of internet connected objects. But one of the things that we made that wasn't at all successful was a $125 umbrella that was inspired by this object. How many people remember the object on the left? Who, does somebody want to share what, what, it, what its name is and what it does? Yes, it's an orc detection uh, sword, right. So it's, so it's, you know, it sting uh, is useful because, you know, if you're Frodo and you're, you know, you're carrying the sword, you might as well have an object that anticipates its own use. But for me, it was like one of these emblematic, couldn't be simpler and more convenient, to sort of bake the interface into the hilt of the sword. So I thought, well, how could we sort of generalize that for being uh, aware of something that's happening in Boston? And I guess it, you know, it rained some there. So, you know, having, uh, the handle glow when, when rain was forecast. For me, it's still, you know, even though it wasn't a successful product, it's still um, sort of, a, for me, a, an idea about how simple the Internet of Things could be in terms of how we interact with technology. So that's sort of been my theme, and I'd like to share with you a bunch of examples from the Media Lab where I teach, students inventing Internet-connected rings and pillows and all kinds of things. Um, and specifically today, focus on healthcare. And we've got a great set of people um, from companies uh, that are working on commercializing these ideas, and I have some war stories as well. And the theme is gonna be around sort of what will be the new business model for internet-connected things in health. And luckily, there are lots of options for business models. I mean, because internet-connected things change your consumption patterns of pills, they lower healthcare costs, you know, they, uh, they change th uh, a business model that might be just based on uh, selling objects to selling services. And so I think that, that hopefully will spark good, good discussion afterwards. And I'm used to teaching and being pinged by uh, interesting questions from, from people in the audience. So if you have ideas or disagree with something, like I'll chime in and we can make it a discussion. Um, teleportation shoes. Um, Dorothy could click her heels together and get back to, where did she get back to again? Kansas, right? And, uh, you know, I think from Greek gods like Nike to new shoe companies, I think, you know, these, what's interesting to me about these sort of magical objects is you, is they have a place in your life, they have a retail distribution strategy, and they have an expectation that you bring for the object. And so as soon as you start imbuing a little bit more capability in that object, people believe it's magic. You know, it exceeds expectations. It, um, it surprises people in a nice way. So I, and as part of my book, I went back and looked at fairy tales like the Brothers Grimm and Hans Christian Andersen and all of these stories that we all know from our youth, sort of surveying them for magical things like magic carpets or purses that replenish or, uh, or uh, vessels that refill with wine to fill a multitude. Um, and one of them, of course, is the magic mirror that reveals the sort of narcissistic question about you know, who's the fairest of them all. And there's a company that's actually here at South by Southwest. They're on a, a short list of, of, uh, for, for an award. And they make, this, they make this product, which is called the memory mirror. I, th I thought I had a little bit of video. And this reveals the sort of fairest outfit of them all. So it's being trialed right now at Neiman Marcus and it essentially, it conceals a camera, it does keystone perspective correction, and, and then knows what the gesture is so you can see real self versus recent self, and then share, share them on Facebook so your friends will like nudge you to buy the, to buy the right outfit. 
Um, but one thing I really like about this is it's taking an, a very ordinary surface, you know, a mirror, like think how many mirrors are in retail stores, and then imbuing it with this sort of special capability that actually drives um, more transactions. We have these trash cans all around Cambridge. Does anybody else have, have uh, smart trash cans in their town? Are they? <laughs> um, well, these are nice. These are by a local uh, Boston company called Big Belly. And they have solar panels on the top, which are convenient because they, they don't need a power line and they compress the trash. But then they also only call the, the expensive union guys with the stinky truck when they're full. So this is like, the, I love this example, not only because there are a ton of trash cans in the world, so if you're Silicon Labs, this is like a nice, a, a nice example. Um, <clears throat> These are sort of expensive, I think they're $4,000, but they have a cell, a cell modem inside and, uh, and they only call the truck and then they do the sort of MIT undergrad problem set of like what's the shortest path to pick up all the, all the full trash cans around town. Um, I often get asked, I've been working on a lot of interactive furniture and a lot of people say, well, isn't, you know, how often do people upgrade their coffee tables or their dine or their conference room tables or all these, all these uh, big hardware things in the world? But it seems to me like over there updates sort of addresses that, that um, lifespan issue. Like the half life of a car could be maybe longer. Maybe it's a, it makes a more sustainable world if we can, if we can upgrade functionality from afar um, and to have new feature sets sort of. Uh, come out automatically. Any Tesla drivers in the in the room? No. I just love it when you go when you go to shop for a Tesla and you, and they, you say, well, does it have this feature? They say, no, nah, it'll probably be in the next update. You know, it's like, like it makes the sales guy's job so much easier because he doesn't he doesn't have to commit to anything. He can just like, oh, it's probably be, in, be out in the next update. <laughs> I wanted to show you um, my house and some enchanted objects in my house. Enchanted objects are ordinary things that have the same functionality that they had before, except now they can talk, they're connected. These are ordinary things that have extraordinary capabilities. When we're creating technology for the home, really we want to make something that's seamless and transparent. And that as opposed to having things sort of call out and draw your attention to it, make it a more ambient experience. It will just continue to behave with those everyday objects as we, as we do in the world, and we'll, we can remain focused on connectivity between two people. What we're seeing now is this proliferation of different devices that are you know, moving out from the cell phone and onto our bodies and into the world. So in the middle of our living room is a coffee table that uh, has Google Earth embedded in the coffee table. And I just found that having access to this amazing zoomable map completely changes how often we talk about travel and how often we talk about the world and how often we look up places that are mentioned. And it's really, it's nice to have, you know, this, this beautiful large reference object, you know, sitting in the middle of our living space. Our devices can be a lot simpler and the interaction to them can be a lot simpler. The internet connected umbrella can just be an umbrella that only shows whether it's going to rain. You don't need to tap on an icon or do anything that seems sort of artificial. We come from a time in which we need to adapt to our homes and not the other way around. So what if our home could be a platform that we personalize and we customize? The key is how do we create this ecosystem, these technologies that allow us to move from one experience to the other in the more seamless, the more seamless, uh, most uh, magical way. No? Some people might think that a connected home is overwhelming, that there'll be so much information in the connected home that it's just a cacophonous environment and you wouldn't want to live there. But I think about how we decorate our homes today. We put photographs everywhere, we put paintings up, we put post-it notes up. You know, there's a lot of decoration and adornment in the home. And I think if enchanted objects can be designed in the right way, we're going to want hundreds of them around us. I think what we're going to see is a, a, a new renaissance where designers as well as computer scientists are going to really make a really big impact in the type of technology that we see in the home. The history of computers has mostly been about efficiency. I think one of the things that's changing is that enchanted objects can be about adding motion and an add magic to the fabric of our everyday lives and experiences.
Isn't that six-year-old cute? <laughs> <laughs> so I made a poster that I'll send to anybody who wants one um, that goes with the book that tries to make this little periodic table of, I don't know, things that I found inspiring that help satisfy these wishes we've had forever that are revealed through fairy tales. You know, the wishes for omniscience or telepathy or safekeeping. I'll just bop through a couple of these and, and today's especially focus on sort of our wish for a long life. Um, but I do want to go back to omniscience because it's the basis for most computer applications. Uh, for me, the most emblematic object is sort of is the uh, crystal ball that sort of tells you where the monkeys are or what the future will be. <laughs> um, and uh, I created about 15 years ago now a single pixel browser which actually had a pager chip inside because using an 8,000 tower pager network was the best way to get data you know, to anybody who would buy one of these things at Brookstone or Hamaker Schlemmer or Sharper Image. Um, and the, the, the pixel just changed color and the color was uh, set to track some data feed that was dynamic. So what's the weather going to be tomorrow in Boston? It would pulse also if it's going to rain. Um, is the stock market up or down? Uh, what's the pollen count if your kid is asthmatic or if you're into sailing? Is it too windy or not windy enough or just right? Uh, the first derivative of barometric pressure is often indicative of when the fish are biting, so that a lot of you know, people would like to know something about a hobby. Um, and the real lesson from this company, if I had to sum it up, was that when you have data that's unavoidable, it really tends to change behavior versus having data that's buried in apps, right? So if you have, like when you put the stock orb in, on somebody's mantle in their home, and you say, don't change your behavior, but that's the stock market, like they're gonna call their broker, they're gonna go online and check it more often, they're gonna look at those days where it's way up and way down and they're, they're going to change their behavior. So I think if, you're, if the goal is behavior change, which it is for most health companies, you know, the sensing has to be passive and the data has to be unavoidable in order to, I think, really incite behavior change. Um, so that sort of the lesson for me there was that pervasive is persuasive. Um, and the company today is only focused on energy, on this device for energy companies to help you understand what's the load on the grid and how much you're paying for energy right now. Because people will change their behavior predictably if they sort of have this sense of, you know, the, uh, that the, there's a high load right now on the grid and if you don't conserve, it's gonna either gonna cost you more money or you're gonna cause a brownout. Um, and <laughs> this works at different scales too. There was a bank in North Carolina that came to us and said, we believe in these behavioral feedback loops and we want to put customer satisfaction as we measure it in real time from the phone system onto an obelisk and put the obelisk like in front of the bank and have the color represent you know, how well we're doing as a company based on customer satisfaction. So we, you know, we did, it's always blue. Just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so another, ca another category, just to sort of skip around, is you know, the sort of promise, the fantasy, uh, or the desire for remaining safe. And um, I installed an August lock uh, at home, and it's really nice, because you, know, you, feel, you feel like the door is more likely to lock behind you because it automatically locks. Uh, it's nice when you automatically approach the door and it just unlocks, and then you, plus you can give your brother-in-law access, but only for 24 hours, and then you can say, you can say after that, you can't get in anymore. So it's nice to have that sort of plasti plasticity of control. Um, I've also, I like, I kill plants so regularly that I've been excited for this device, which is a, what is this called again? Does anybody remember? Sold in Verizon stores, what is it? Flower Power, that's right. It's sold by um, Perrault, right? A French company, right. Uh, and uh, it senses um, uh, uh, wetness, otherwise known as moisture. <laughs> um, it senses pH and it also senses uh, uh, light incidence on the, on the sensor. So it's nice because your, your plants can sort of complain at you if you're, if you're about, if you're, as you're killing them. Um, also, I mean, this, this uh, sort of need for not losing your, your stuff is something that I think is really, I still have a paper calendar that I use that I like. As well, and uh, I put one of these tiles on it. That, that's not my purse. But it's nice because you, know, you can make this make a chirp so you can figure out where it is or if you left it at school or something, it, you, you can see on a map in the app like the last place you left your car keys or car or whatever the object is. So it seems like a lot of people will stick these around. Has any, uh, anybody else tried the tile, the little Bluetooth, Bluetooth LE object? Um, 
or dogs. There are lots of dogs. In fact, <laughs> I mean, I think there's a market for um, tracking things, especially if there's uh, large, large volumes of, of precious things. But I wanted to show you another example of an object that you probably haven't seen. This is not commercialized yet, but we worked with um, Bank of America is one of the sponsors at the Media Lab. And they came to us and they said, you know, the problem is with plastic, people have no feedback. You know, you just sort of spend, 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 and you know, who knows how you're doing. So they said, could you sort of add some feedback loop, some sense of how you're doing to plastic, you know, to the credit cards? And we thought, thought about it, and we said, well, what if we made a tangible interface so that we have a variable resistance hinge on the wallet, so it becomes like, like harder to open if you're blowing through your budget, your monthly budget. So it was sort of like, it was a way of like having this, rather than making it a pixel-based display, it was just a, a touch-based display. But what I really like about this is it's, you know, it's taking an inventory of all the, all the objects that people touch throughout the day or actuate, and then trying to imbue that gesture with a little bit of, of, of uh, information, right? So it doesn't require doing something new. Um, so on to health. Uh, I think you know the, the fantasy of a potion that heals you has been present in many narratives, including Lucy in Narnia, who had a magic healing potion. Pharma companies make magic healing potions that people don't take. Um, and uh, these bottles at the Media Lab were really inspiring to me. They have a jazz trio embedded in the bottles. So as you pull each cork off, you get the keyboard, that's the bass. And that's the drum, right? So the interface really couldn't be easier. Like it's it's just uncorking something, right? It's just sort of it's a uh, having some uh, having some information in that gesture. So uh, we started working on a smart pill pill tray at a company that I founded about five years ago now, six years ago that we've sold. Um, and when we took this sort of beautiful Gucci-like day of the week pill, pill container to CVS and to Walgreens and we said, we've solved it. We, we went out and did user research. We understood how people store pills. You know, these bottles suck. Like people, people should have trays that, so that where they put their pills together. And we've designed some beautiful ones that look like they're inspired by the fashion industry and they have nice materials. And we, we trialed them on, we, we tested them on people and they love them. And they're connected because they have this little um, wireless chip inside. Um, they, the pharma industry said, eh, like you, that violates four legal regs at least. Like that's not light and tight. Uh, there are transaction effects between drug, between pills. Like there's all kinds of problems with that idea. So we sort of went back to the drawing board. We said, oh, so what's the simplest little intervention we could make in the existing pharma workflow to actually make something that's deployed at scale? So we said, okay, let's, let's assume that we're not gonna change this part of the problem. And so we're just gonna, we're just gonna try to redesign the cap. So that's what we did. We, we, we added sensors in the cap, we added a push to refill button, um, and, and just a sensor, like it couldn't, <laughs> all my friends at the media lab were like, really, that's all you did? <laughs> you like added a sensor to a pill bottle cap? Come on, like can't you sense the number of pills with a capacitive sensor or something more interesting? But anyway, that's all we did. Um, and we worked with AT&T, we made a night light, which is sort of like the orb that talks to multiple caps. Um, and then we worked with uh, MGH and did a study for hypertension. And the data, this is just a snapshot of the data that shows these are days and those are people. And pink means they didn't open the cap that day. So they probably didn't take the med if they didn't open the cap. So this is the baseline behavior. This is just using a sensor, sensor only. And then we designed a set of little interventions like it glows with color and then it makes cute little arpeggios. Do, 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 do. And then five minutes later, it goes do, 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 do. It's sort of trying to be like the, the most gentle butler you've ever had who's like, <clears throat> <clears throat> like who's, who's sort of nudging you in a, but in a polite way. Um, and once we turned on the things, um, we, got, we, we got, this is what the, a snapshot of the data looks like. So we, it was a huge change in behavior and it was something that was immediately monetizable because Novartis who was selling $75 meds for um, transplant, for example, or for cancer, um, you know, have, the cost of the cap was three bucks. The cost that we had to pay AT&T for the connectivity was a dollar a month. So offering them a service for 15 or $20 a month with a lot of margin in it 
was, was a no-brainer, because if somebody takes one more pill in the month, then you've, you sort of, you've won. Um, and so I, I, for me, that's sort of a behavior change that's, that's where the packaging can be entirely, the smart packaging is entirely subsidized by the behavior change that you can, that you can invoke. Um, so these are the different feedback loops. It's sort of personal things, and then would email a loved one, which for a lot of people is really motivating. One of the questions later is if we're trying to change people's behavior, do you more believe in the social incentives or financial incentives or the sentinel effect? Like having a doctor know really motivates certain people. You mean my doctor knows what I've done? Like a lot of people are like, wow, that, you know, my dad was a doctor, so I don't care. <laughs> like, he's like, a, what? I don't, that's not motivating to me, but for many people it is. Or is it just a convenience factor of having the caps refill themselves because they, because the pharmacy knows. This is the network. But AT&T loves it because it's a subsidized way of getting another cell phone into every home in America. In here, video games are not confined to screens. This is one of their ads that they, that they did. In here, medicine talks to you and dogs. In here, pets never get lost. It's the AT&T network, and what's possible... This was the highlight. Remembering to take your pills can be difficult. I have a little mnemonic device I use to remind myself. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday are the days I take my pills. <laughs> or it might be nights, I don't remember. Well, the Vitality Corporation has a solution called Glow Caps. Jim? Glow Caps are internet connected pill caps that go on regular pill bottles. Now, each day when it's time for Grandpa to take his heart pills, the Glow Cap pulses with this light. If he doesn't see this light for some reason, the Glow Cap plays a ringtone, kind of like a cell phone. <laughs> now, here's where it really gets cool. If Grandpa misses a pill, the glow cap will call his home phone as a reminder. This is perfect, because while old people can be forgetful, they are great when it comes to setting up the internet, <laughs> recognizing cell phone ringtones, and accessing voicemail messages. Um, so I hope we, that on the panel we can talk about all of the other things that are sensible, not only in the sort of um, uh, disease state world, but also in the wellness world. I mean, and for me, it's sort of it's in addition to meds and activity and food. I think mood and stress is a big is a, is a big opportunity, um, and also <laughs> sleep, of course. At last year's South by Southwest, um, <laughs> I saw her. Uh, she's the um, she's the tester for the for the Shine products uh, for Misfit Shine. What's that? Oh, you're inside the Shine. Great, great. Um, well, she was she was doing side by side comparison and you know, was trying to trying to understand sort of how to baseline these things. But to me, like this is not like I am not an agent of Withings, but I'm just an independent guy who happens to be wearing one of the Withings watches. And I love this example because it's really made the jump from white plastic to some, you know to fashion, right? Like this is, and I'm and I'm intrigued by other types of. Um, sort of partnerships with, with Tory Burch and Fitbit or with Savorsky and, and, uh, and Misfit Shine. Like it just seems like these, these mashups between fashion brands and tech will be the way that these things enter most of our lives. And, and by the way, the fashion brands also have a heritage, a distribution channel, crazy margins, you know, I mean, like that's where we should be going, I think, in order to get, in order to get scale. Um, this is the Swarovski, if that's, um, and I think the other thing, the other big thing to solve, which I know a lot of you are working on, is making these things um, not require as much care and feeding. This is, there's a company in Boston called Sunsprite, they make this little clip, could be button sized, I'm sure you could make it button sized, but it's for people in the north, like me, who get depressed this time of year, because there's not a lot of light. So it's seasonal effect, affective disorder. So it just measures how much light are you getting and, and it has a little Bluetooth chip and tells your phone that and tries to encourage you to you know, get outside more and get some more light in your, in your eyes or get a dog or something. But, um, you know, I, but it, it also has solar patch on the, on the device. So it, there, you can't charge it. You, know, it's, you, take, you take care of it by getting out in the sun and it takes care of you by getting you out in the sun. 
So I really like these devices that don't require ever charging. And I'm also, and I also think sort of one of the one of the uh, keys to the to the category is to try to find the most ordinary of everyday objects and imbue them with some sort of sense. Um, this was a fork that we prototyped at the Media Lab. The student had this insight that um, when when people eat too fast, they eat too much, right? Like you don't get the feedback of feeling full if you just shovel it in. So he put in a little accelerometer. Uh, um, and a perturber on this fork so that you'd sort of miss your, like if you ate too fast, it would introduce some palsy into the fork, you know, which is a terrible idea. You know, he's not gonna sell, <laughs> sell any of them, but it's sort of a cool idea, like that you could even put these things on forks. But actually, this is a, a commercial product today called Happy Fork that measures how quickly you eat. I mean, I don't like this because it's only paternalistic. You know, it's only the downside. Maybe if it had some other, like, food incentive. Um, this, was, this is concept only, but I, I do think that measuring food is one of these like, super hard things to do because no one's willing to use Lose It or My Fitness Pal or whatever loyally day after day. I think you know, embedding a sensor um, or a Pico projector and camera in a salt shaker or something else that's on the table and then projecting information adjacent to your food might be a, might be a good idea. Um, these people called Vessel in San Francisco are trying to measure what you drink as long as you're willing to drink everything out of there, um, out of that, which is sort of seems problematic. But I, I, you know, it seems like the, the world, and you'll talk about, Rob will talk later about sort of stickers, but the world of being able to just, you know, you don't need to make a plastic cap if you could just make a sticker with an accelerometer that goes on the cap, right? So, it, so these things are becoming easier um, and sort of more parasitic, I think, over time. I just want to tell you a little bit about what I'm working on now. Um, and um, the th sort of last category I talk about is all about um, objects, enchanted objects that help us create and make. Things like Guitar Hero that helps us feel more confident to make music, or Lego Mindstorms that help us feel more confident to build robots or this product, which is called a, a, or a prototype called an I.O. brush, where you just sample the world with the brush and then paint the pattern or the animation. Um, I mean, I, this is my favorite category of technology that can empower us to uh, be more creative and more human. Um, I've been interested in photography for a long time, and, uh, and I don't know if, has anybody tried wearable um, life logging cameras? Anybody? Are you wearing one now? No. Why not? Why didn't you wear it today? Is it a battery issue or you're, you're, you think it's obnoxious or? What's that? It was a oh, it was a friend's camera, uh-huh. This is a little camera by a company, a Swedish company called Narrative. Um, they should work with Silicon Labs to make it small, <laughs> smaller. <laughs> but uh, it takes a photo every 30 seconds. And, uh, and then uh, has a GPS also inside so it knows where the photo's taken. So you get to these sort of little flip books at the end of the day that show you how you spent your time. You should try one, because it's, like, it's a pretty interesting sort of self-reflective uh, tool. You, know, you can see like, how much time are you spending with students or, uh, or indoors or outdoors or this was a, a workshop I taught in Copenhagen with a magician. He was teaching me some card tricks during the day. And then it was a long lunch. You could see the long lunch. So it really it helps you understand the sort of things about your life. And I've been really intrigued with the, the amount of photos that are shared on social media, even before people will start have life logging cameras. So my current company called Ditto Labs is training um, Amazon's Elastic Cloud to look at every photo that's posted on social media and see what's inside. So we, we're tr we've trained on you know, Vera Bradley patterns or Gucci or Prada or KFC or Harley Davidson or you know, using machine learning and computer vision to sort of look at the pixels and see where the brand is being used and how and then sell the data back to the brands. Because um, they all want to know how are, how's my product being used and with what things. And most of, most of the time people aren't loyal about transcribing what's in the photo. You know, they just have like a corona and they say booyah or something. You know, like they don't, they don't say, my corona at a beach, you know, adjacent to, blah, blah, blah. Um, so we're looking for products and clothing and faces and facial expressions and logos and scenes and sort of seeing what we can see. And, you know, this is obviously an interesting ad tech play, although I'm, I'm um, 
emboldened or happy that uh, it's being used by University of Chicago and John Hopkins to look for like smoking behavior or other sorts of public health behavior as well. And so you can sort of see what other things people are doing in the world, like at South by, I don't know what we're gonna do. Um, and ultimately it seems like this becomes what shopping will become because to the extent that we, we look at our friends' photos on social media more than we look at product catalogs today, which I think is true, um, we can see nice things in our friends' photos, like their experiences at the beach, or a beautiful dress, or an uh, inspiring restaurant or something, and then you can learn more about that or go to the ball game yourself. So a last idea before we, before we do the, the panel is, uh, I write in the book about like if you're in the business of making things connected or enchanting things, like what, what's, a, what's a stepwise way that you could start to do this? So like say you have a scale, um, you might first solve the problem of getting it connected to the cloud and then solve the problem of have it, having it know something about you. Um, so maybe that's you know, a partnership with a company that understands profiles. And then maybe it should know something about your social network, like tweeting, tweeting your weight, like I mistakenly did. Or maybe it should uh, do gamification sort of techniques to give you goal, specific goals um, and ways to motivate you. And finally, maybe there's a story inside the scale. And Withings hasn't done this yet, so I challenge you to do this. But the story that we did inside this trash can that we connected, so we made a trash can that has a camera that looks at what you throw out. And sort of the idea was, well, maybe you, should, you want to replenish the things you throw out. You know, you throw out a, a can of clam chowder in Boston, maybe you want another can of clam chowder. You know, sort of like a supply chain management for the house, right? Um, and we did that, and we sort of did the connection, and we personalized it by connecting it to your Amazon account. But then it was sort of boring, because it was just like reordering stuff. So we made a story out of it by having uh, somebody live in the trash can and then just give you a hard time about things you threw out. <laughs> so if you continue to throw out something that's not good for you, like the third box of cookies this week, it might you know, propose a healthier snack or something that's out of season or something that's you know, coconut water all the way from Asia. Are you sure you want that? <laughs> you know, so it's a, a way that of sort of offering these sort of little nudges to, uh, to improve this sort of everyday gesture of just throwing stuff out. So I think... Um, the, actually, just can I show one more thing? Just one more thing, okay. So the last thing I'm super excited about um, right now, because it's a piece of furniture that is going into some uh, corporate offices. I read this book called Quiet. Has anybody else read Quiet? It talks about how introverts have just as many good ideas as extroverts, right? But they just get suppressed in, in conversation. So I thought, why don't we make a, a table that provides feedback to a team so that you can tell just by looking down at the surface of the table whether, you know, maybe it's appropriate for her to be talking and nobody else to be talking, but maybe it's not appropriate. So it's sort of a table that sort of tries to promote conversational balance, like my dinner table never has um, around it. So it conceals a series of um, super small LEDs and microphones at every facet of the table um, to give you this sense, this feedback over time of sort of who's who's speaking more, and, and it's sort of a self-facilitating table. And right now it looks like that, which is starting to look better. Um, so it's Corian, and if anybody wants to try one, like get in touch with me afterwards, because I'm intrigued with like how, how this technology could enter our lives in ways that are subtle and hopefully elegant, and, but still useful and, and uh, sort of embedded in everyday things. So, in conclusion, we want interfaces that are tangible like the wallets and haptic and incidental like the table and embedded like the pill cap and expressive like the paintbrush and hopefully that will make our, our uh, interaction with technology more humanistic. Thank you. Yeah.